everyone. Welcome to Keto and Crime. We are back to our coverage of the Third Reich with a very interesting uh, person. Today we are looking at Theodore Morel, Dr. Theodore Morel. He was Hitler's personal physician and a personal physician to many in Hitler's inner circle. And let me tell you, this is going to be a wild one. First of all, I have no hope that this will be monetized because some of the stuff I have to talk about so if you'd like to subscribe, donate, any of that join my Patreon, join the channel, all those links are below. I'm going to jump into this real quick. I do apologize for not being on camera. I do like to put things that relate to these stories in the video so that you're not just staring at me. And right now I am suffering from allergies and sinuses you would not believe. And I literally look like Rocky Raccoon, so I don't want to put myself on camera right now. But with that being said, let's dive in and talk about Dr. Theodore Morell. Before I dive into Dr. Morell, I want to give you some background. Yes, I'm going to rehash what I always say at the beginning of these videos. For Germany, for the former German Empire that fell after World War I, the time between the establishment of the Weimar Republic and the rise of the Third Reich were terrible because of the huge amount of retributions and reparations that the Allies had enforced upon them, uh, inflation, the fact that the Allies were not only taking the money but loaning them money at exorbitant rates, uh, it put German, Germany into a tailspin of economic superinflation, um, economic peril, and the fact that they were, you know, now in a brand new form of government that they had never been in before. They went from a, mon a monarchy to now a, a constitutional republic, and there was just a whole lot of upheaval. Also, many, many people that were had served in the army or had lived through Germany's heyday as the German Empire prior to World War I were very disenfranchised. They were looking for scapegoats, and those scapegoats were anyone that was not a white, purebred Aryan German. So... Germans of Jewish descent, homosexuals, gypsies, and even uh, Germans of Slavic descent, that is more on the Russian, Eastern European side, were all, especially their political rivals for those in power, all of those were considered the reason that Germany lost the war. And so there was a whole lot of upheaval going on. But the one shining light in Germany at that time, even though its economy was decimated by all these debts they had to pay and all the superinflation and also you had the stock market crash and the Great Depression coming in in 1929, they had a shining beacon and that was the drug and chemical trade. Germany was on the forefront of developing chemicals and drugs for daily living. Now, the chemicals we know are a lot of the pesticides that we use today. They have been hope they have been re-engineered and hopefully made a little bit safer, as well as the very evil Zyklon B that was used for the final solution. In addition to all of that, uh, they were huge in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, they developed aspirin and other types of painkillers. Antibiotics were all developed in Germany to great, great fanfare and to the, to the betterment of their economy. However, while they were going through all of this, there was also a lot of stuff that was first synthesized or even invented in Germany during this time that would end up being the, one of the downfalls of the Third Reich. And so recreational drugs became huge in Germany. I mean, things were so bad, you just had to, you know, escape it. So things like amphetamines, and that includes methamphetamines in one of its earlier forms, as well as heroin, cocaine, all these illicit drugs were either invented or synthesized in Germany and were pretty widespread. I mean, this is during the time that Coca-Cola actually had cocaine in it, and the Germans loved it. So you had this whole drug culture going on in Germany where everybody was high. Let's see why this isn't going to be monetized. And then you had the Third Reich who 
held themselves up as these teetotalers, you know, walk the straight line kind of people that wanted to put a halt to all this. So you had some of these things become illegal while some of them were perfectly legal. And even if they were illegal, sometimes the Third Reich used them for their own purposes. And we're going to talk about that. So this is kind of the atmosphere. You had a lot of upheaval and you had a lot of drug use. And that leads to a really bad time. And so step in Dr. Theodore Morel, who was coined by many others in the Third Reich as the injector of the Third Reich, the mad injector, because he used a needle so freely. And we're going to talk about how he got that name and what he did. And let's dive in. Theodore Gilbert Morel was born July 22, 1886 in the German United German Empire in the Grand Duchy of Hesse. He was the ch second child of a middle school teacher and a homemaker. He showed a huge aptitude for science and medicine and ended up studying medicine in both Grenoble and Paris. He then trained in obstetrics and gynecology in Munich in 1910. And in 1913, he became fully licensed as a physician. His first assignment was to be on the cutting edge of the German study of STDs, believe it or not, namely gonorrhea. And he, as an OBGYN, he learned all these new techniques, the diagnosis, you know, working on things like that. And that is how he became Hitler's uh, personal physician. But before that, he married. I don't want to talk about gonorrhea and say he got married. It, it, the, the two were not related. But he married a wealthy actress by the name of Helenor Moeller. And he had a pretty thriving practice uh, in Germany before becoming Hitler's personal physician. He l did unconventional treatments toward things and was wild about the injection of vitamins just for better living. Anything that he did, he not only did he treat it with the latest stuff to treat that illness, he also was a big believer in supplemental and he jacked people up on vitamins to give them energy. So he also served for a time in the military as a uh, army doctor and a naval doctor. And then uh, he also actually turned down positions, uh, positions to serve the Shah of Persia and the King of Romania as a personal physician. Now let's talk about gonorrhea again. Um, he was actually summoned by Hitler and Hitler's inner circle in 1935 when Heinrich Hoffmann, remember the photographer that worked for Hitler that was Eva Brahms boss, he had come down with gonorrhea and Theodore, Dr. Morell, treated him with his normal valley of things, not only antibiotics and, and things like that, but also vitamins, and basically uh, got him back on his feet, and Hoffman told Hitler that Morell saved his life. And as a result, he was officially named Hitler's personal physician in 1936 because Hitler was suffering for, from bad stomach IBS, lots of things that he had. Hitler had a lot of medical conditions, which when we talk about Hitler, we'll talk about a lot of the conditions he had. But he had a lot of gastrointestinal issues, and that is what Morel first treated him for, that were complicated and exacerbated by his vegetarian diet, which included not only fruits and vegetables, all high fiber foods, but also lots of grains and beans. And when you, I'm not saying a vegetarian diet is bad for you, but when you combine it with somebody that already has digestive issues, it can cause quite a flurry. He was known as the master of flatulence. I mean, he had uncontrollable flatulence, uncontrollable bowel movements that went from constipation to diarrhea, and also severe, severe abdominal pain. And Morel began treating him with uh, various preparations. Uh, he used a combination of vitamins, including hydros including mixing it with E. coli bacteria, 
which uh, was basically farmed from Eva Braun and other people close to Hitler's um, excrement. So he got a poop transplant. He gave Hitler a poop transplant to actually get his digestive, his gut biome back in order so that he could easily pass food and not fart everybody into oblivion. Because his cramps and the flatulence went away, as well as a rash that Hitler had had for a long time on his leg that just happened to go away. Um, yeah, Hitler thought he was the best thing since sliced bread. So he was on board. And during his time with Hitler, he treated just about everyone inside the inner circle of the Third Reich. And he did this by not only treating ailments, but also giving them the energy that they needed to go about their daily tasks. So he would inject them with vitamins and also sparingly and liberally, both at the same time, because Hitler didn't really like the use of amphetamines and stuff like that. But he got hooked on it because they were using an early form of methamphetamine and... He basically uh, was hyping the members of the Third Reich up on amphetamines to get them through their day. And they had all this energy. They felt good because of the vitamins, or at least they thought they felt good. And he, yeah, he was the injector master. He also uh, began treating Hitler with a daily injection of uh, oil and water mixed with uh, a vitamin proprietary blend of his own that he called Vita, Vita Milton. And it would get Hitler up and going out of bed, although it also had a little bit of a methamphetamine in it, which will get anybody out of the bed. But um, he also treated Heydrich Himmler with the same thing. And um, Hitler became so addicted to the stuff that he would do things like stop his private train if Mueller wasn't on board to allow Mueller to get on board and treat him. So Hitler went from, you know making him feel good to he just needed it to survive, as did a lot of the members of the Third Reich. In addition, during a lot of the most famous um, German campaigns, that is uh, the disastrous invasion of the Soviet Union, Operation Barbarossa, as well as the invasions of France and the African campaigns, it was also noted that these same methamphetamine vitamin mixtures that Mueller was giving to the hierarchy of the Third Reich had also been sent out to be used by the soldiers and the pilots that were on these large-scale invasions to get them going. It is said that Rommel, during the invasion of France and during the Africa campaign, was so hopped up on methamphetamine that he drove a tank for two days and barreled right into a line of French troops. Whether or not that's true or not, that's what they say. So, as you can see, they were all hugely, hugely dependent on substances. The most infamous tale of Dr. Morell is uh, in 1939, after Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia. The Czech president, Emil Hasha, was uh, brought to Berlin to meet with Hitler, and he became so scared of his situation that he fainted some said by virtue of a heart attack and instead of just letting him wake up naturally or getting him a doctor that wasn't going to do further harm to him it is said that morel injected him with some of his funny juice and hopped him got him back up on his feet so he could essentially surrender czechoslovakia to the to the nazis um and then in 1944, after the uh, Valkyrie attempted assassination, um, Mueller doubled the amount of drugs he was given to Hitler to kind of get him back into a mental and physical state because Hitler had been in decline for a long time. It was also around this time that Hitler started showing evidence of Parkinson's disease, and um, Mueller would treat him with a cocktail to keep those from being so apparent. In fact, the substances that Mueller is known to have administered to both Hitler and members of the Third Reich number about 34 different substances. Uh, bromide, cartazol, cocaine, and adrenaline. 
uh, oxyco uh, uh, early form of oxycodone, uh, glucose, pure sugar. He would give them pure sugar injections, uh, homotrin, uh, all sorts of other uh, opi opioids. He would give them all kinds of, of vitamins as well as caffeine and even testosterone to treat things like erectile dysfunction and uh, to give them energy. He believed anything would give you energy, it seems. So 34 different drugs that he would mix and match to keep these people up on their feet and leading a Germany. Him, Heinrich Kimmer and other members of the Third Reich began to be very suspicious of Morel. They felt that Morel was keeping uh, Hitler drugged up and basically pulling the strings. And uh, to that end, Reinhard Heydrich, who we will be covering next week, who was the inventor of the final solution when he was uh, assassinated in Czechoslovakia, uh, Mueller was brought in by Hitler to treat him, but the doctors that Himmler and others had already brought in refused to listen to him, and uh, Heydrich ended up dying. So then Hitler, of course, blamed them, not Morel, because Morel was his doctor feel good. Why would he, you know, why would he turn against him? And uh, so that just kind of solidified him as somebody that Hitler needed. Um, he did things to... Uh, keep Hitler when Hitler started to develop jaundice in 1944 as a result of everything that had been done to him. Um, he was using things like strychnine and belladonna to keep the yellowness of the eyes and the skin away. Just really radical things. He went from a very respected doctor and researcher in the in the field of venereal disease to this, to just a doctor feel good to get you through the day. By the time that uh, April 1945, when the war turned badly against the Germans and Hitler was hiding in the bunker under the Reich's Chancellery, basically Mueller was with him until almost the last day, and he was giving him at least four injections and about 20 pills a day to keep him going. And then when it became to almost the end, on April 20th, 1945, Morel, along with uh, Albert Borman, who we've already done a video on, and some other high-ranking uh, Nazis, left the bunker and left Hitler to his own devices. And it is said that Mueller gave uh, Hitler and Eva Braun the cyanide capsules that would take their lives. And he was he managed to get out of a of a flight of out of Berlin on the 23rd of April. He was captured in May of 1945 by American forces and interrogated. Uh, some of the most notable among them said that he was a disgusting man, his hygiene was terrible, and he was grossly obese. He ended up dying in a German hospital uh, on May 26, 1948 from complications related to obesity and drug abuse. So even though he didn't abused drugs as much as the people he was injecting, he did partake in it. And so, as you can see, this is a, a very short life. I mean, not a very short life. He was 61 when he died. But he was one of the driving forces behind the Third Reich's success in the beginning and their decline. Would the war have gone differently if Hitler wasn't so jacked up on drugs? Or if the members of the Third Reich weren't so jacked up on drugs? What do you think? Do you think there would have been a different outcome? Uh, let me know down below, and let me know if you enjoyed this. I know this was a very short video, but not much to say, but I do think it's an interesting aspect that rarely gets covered about Adolf Hitler. And until next time, keto and ground.